Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're so delighted to have you here with us today for our lunchtime discussion on investing in a green economy in New York City. I'm Catherine Sacco, Director of Partnerships at the Urban Design Forum, zooming in today from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Before we dive into our discussion, I wanna share a little background on the Forefront Fellowship. The Forum created this program because it believes that designers, developers, and civic leaders have a responsibility to address enduring injustices in the built environment. This year, we gathered 26 outstanding, diverse, and interdisciplinary urban practitioners to investigate how New York City can channel investment in building retrofits to minority and women-owned businesses, employee-owned businesses, and workers of color. You might ask yourself, why is an urban design organization looking at the intersection of environmental justice and economic justice? Well, we were excited to take on this research because it offered the chance to envision a city where a flourishing ecosystem of MWBEs leads the way on retrofitting our buildings for an energy efficient future, where employee ownership and construction and the trades helps to close the racial wealth gap, and where our economic recovery from the pandemic supports thriving black and brown communities. This fall, we spent three months studying forecasts for local law 97 implementation, surveying the retrofit market and understanding the needs of MWBE owners. Our fellows interviewed over 40 New York based and national experts to generate 10 creative proposals for a fairer and greener city. While our research highlights many of the obstacles currently facing MWBEs in the retrofit market, it also draws on legacies of resourceful, creative and cooperative economic models, particularly among black communities across history to point to promising paths forward. We think there are a few reasons to be especially hopeful right now with the groundswell of activism around the Green New Deal and the new federal administration. We hope this work can support the city's continued efforts to strengthen minority owned businesses while advancing ambitious climate action. Please, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you're working in government agencies, universities or think tanks on these issues and we'll be happy to connect you with the report authors. Today, we're thrilled to have with us Samuel Jung, Deputy Director for Inclusive Economic Development and Business Innovation in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives, who was our steadfast part partner in this research, as well as three of our report's co-authors, Polina Batyarov, Vice President of Development at Omni New York, Donna Yu Hope, Climate Justice Director for Emerald Cities Collaborative, and Kara Michelle, Urban Planning Associate at WXY Studio. Following their presentation, we're thrilled to welcome responses from Saul Brown and Daphne Rose Sanchez. We'll have time for questions towards the end of the hour, so I encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A box throughout the discussion. And finally, I wanna say one last big thank you to our wonderful partners at the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives, Sam Jung, Christine Carella, and Deputy Mayor Thompson. To our team at UDF who supported this work with particular credit to Daniel McPhee's vision and Kima Hibbert's editorial prowess. And most of all to our 26 inspiring Forefront Fellows who authored this report. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Sam. Thank you, Catherine, and to the fantastic team at the Urban Design Forum for your generative partnership and to the brilliant fellows who contributed to the powerful field building resources that, that we're celebrating today. Like Catherine mentioned, my name is Sam Jung and I'm the Deputy Director of Inclusive Economic Development and Business Innovation within the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives here in New York City. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to today's event. Deputy Mayor Thompson's charge to close the racial wealth gap has impelled our office to answer the question of how we, the city, can better design programmatic and policy solutions to advance equity. Local Law 97 in particular provides a unique opportunity to reimagine how our local government can rectify economic inequities as we simultaneously realize climate goals. Through this landmark legislation, our city government is creating a building retrofit market valued upwards of $20 billion. For whom that value will be channeled to will be determined by how we as a municipality shape the market in years to come. To be clear, our office believes that the economic value of this policy enabled market should benefit workers, MWBEs, 
employee-owned businesses and frontline communities of color to further realize a dress transition away from fossil fuel-based systems. To understand the full potential of this market to drive equitable outcomes for the constituents we care about, our office searched for catalytic partnerships to support our research endeavors. The Urban Design Forum and its Forefront Fellows heeded our call and provided robust analyses and recommendations across four topic areas, including supporting MDBBEs, expanding cooperative business development, renewing workforce development systems, and innovation. Of the many clarion calls to action outlined in the Cooperative Works Report, I was in particular struck by one, the robust mandate for municipal intervention into markets to drive equitable outcomes as a departure from new public management theories of the 1980s, underscoring the powerful role localities can play in capturing market value for MDBPEs and newer entrants inclusive of employee-owned businesses to close a racial wealth gap. The second powerful insight outlined in the report is a call to reimagine the role of public-private partnerships through new paradigms for innovation. This is salient because as evidence left to status quo, big businesses with established R&D capacity will invest in ways that exclusively benefit companies that were already poised for success. The fellows have powerfully called to democratize the benefits of R&D and innovation to advance a common good. It is insights and recommendations like these that support our office's charge to scale up inclusive business development strategies and the practice of employee ownership to close a racial wealth gap. I look forward to the fellows presentation and the robust discussion to follow. And once again, thank you all for making the time uh, to learn about this powerful report. Thanks so much, Sam. Now I'd love to welcome on our fellows, Polina, Kara, and Donna to share more about this research. Hello, thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Cool. Um, well, my name is Kara Michelle, she, her, hers. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Polina, a PR of she, her, hers. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donna U. Hope, also she, her, hers. And we are so excited and thrilled and honored to represent the 26 Forefront Fellows. And I'm gonna provide a little context for five minutes and then we're gonna go into Polina to give the insights and then finally wrap it up with Kara with our proposals. So first background in our first slide, we have to remember that justice is intersectional and interrelated. We cannot talk about climate justice if we're not also talking about environmental justice, which is racial justice. And if we're talking about all these things, we have to also bring in social justice, equity justice, because there were specific and intentional policies and practices that were created to give advantages to whites and oppression and disadvantages to BIPOC communities and low-income communities. When we're talking about this intersection, we need to talk about the opportunities that are provided for our communities to make sure that as we expose the inequities of past policies and practices, that we ensure that our communities are beneficiaries of the clean energy future. Next slide, please. As you all know, we're in the throes of a terrible pandemic and our communities, our BIPOC communities already had a higher rate of pre-existing medical conditions and less access to healthcare. But our businesses also suffered even prior to COVID-19, Black and Hispanic owned businesses in particular were more likely to be categorized as at risk or distressed. And this pandemic has only made it worse. Next slide, please. So New York City has uh, published and released a very ambitious set of laws called the Climate Mobilization Act. But really the centerpiece of this package of laws is Local Law 97, because it deals with our buildings. For New York City, we are unique in the country in that our buildings are by far the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. And this legislation looks at our largest buildings, 25,000 square feet and up, which is about 50,000 buildings, which is about 3 billion square feet of real estate. And this legislation says that we are going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% within 30 years by 2050. And it will create, it's estimated, at least $20 billion of market growth as we do these retrofits. 
which is about 140,000 jobs. And we wanna make sure that we are the beneficiary of those jobs. And who are we? Who are the fellows? Next slide, please. As Catherine, Daniel, and Sam mentioned, we are an amazing cohort of 26 individuals who are really a microcosm of New York City. We span a rich and diverse array of racial, ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, identities. We're intergenerational, we're immigrant descendant trailblazers, one of few represented in our fields and organizations. We represent some of the most innovative, progressive, cross-disciplinary thought leadership across the five boroughs of New York City. And make no mistake, we also suffered in this time. We had loved ones suffer and even pass away from this terrible pandemic. We've been caretakers, frontline workers, volunteer helpers, community leaders. Some of us have lost, lost work or been furloughed, but also on the positive note, some of us have gained new employment and added to our families, including new pets. And what we shared also, which helped us persevere is our, in our commonalities, our commitment to advancing racial equity and caring deeply for the environment, which motivated us to carry on and to write this amazing report. And it's our hope that this important work has the potential for significant impact in New York City's equitable trajectory. The research, which my colleagues will go into further, uh, was conducted by doing over 40 interviews with incredible MWBE minority women business enterprise owners, policymakers, academics, scholars, nonprofit industry leaders. And these interviews really shaped our findings towards the insights and hypotheses that were the basis of our proposals. And as our theme is cooperative works, this report takes inspiration from cooperative approaches to business creation and wealth generation to recommend policies, programs, and funding structures that encourage a more just green jobs framework. And with that, I will turn it over to Polina to give the top insights of our report. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Donna. Is my volume okay? I saw a comment in the chat that it was a little low. Great, thank you. So as Donna mentioned, the first section of our report, which is called Insights, covers our analysis of how in this unprecedented moment of multiple converging crises, we can stop, look, and listen to the past and present so that we don't repeat history's errors. In this section, we analyzed opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses, or MWBEs, and employee-owned businesses to truly get a piece of the pie in the emerging green retrofit market. So each of the five insights presented in this section provide consideration for policy or programmatic intervention and is accompanied by a series of relevant challenges and opportunities to holistically understand each of these recommendations. Next slide, please. So in the vein of not making the same mistakes that we've made it before, we must identify appropriate interventions to prevent the new green retrofit market from becoming an extension of the existing construction and real estate development industries dominated by the same non-diverse players and inequitable power and racial dynamics. The capacity challenge here is that the technical and regulatory knowledge that companies need in order to compete in this new retrofit market is very specific and very administra administratively burdensome, and thus has the potential to replicate existing disparities between large construction firms with back office resources and smaller firms without such resources. The procedural challenge is that the city's inclusive business development offerings are limited to certifications and public procurement requirements. And so in order to facilitate a more just economy, the city government must extend its support to minority and women-owned businesses more generally, including providing support for private sector projects. And then the final challenge here is that MWBEs are inherently disadvantaged by the need for increased investment and in operating capital in this new unproven and capital intensive market, since MWBEs face greater barriers to accessing financing due to institutionalized racism in lending practices. So the opportunities are for the city to invest in pivoting existing MWBEs from the construction to the retrofit market. And furthermore, city-led procedural incentives for MWBE contracting could help foster a more democratic retrofit model in this new market. Furthermore, anchor institutions across New York City could drive at scale retrofit work with meaningful MWBE participation in the not-for-profit and private sectors, thus expanding the pie of opportunities. Next slide, please. So these retrofit projects are complicated. Their scale and complexity creates a demand for full service or quote unquote turnkey offerings that disproportionately favor large established typically white owned businesses. And the challenge is that small companies may struggle to compete successfully against these larger firms, 
who have greater capacity and to serve owners of large building portfolios that are the intended target of the Climate Mobilization Act legislation. As such, to make these contracts more competitive for MWB firms, we recommend unbundling large scopes to engage small businesses that are capable of taking on more focused parts of the retrofit process to build their capacity, capital, and track records of success. And additionally, both programmatic support and strategic communications could encourage collaboration and joint ventures between MWBEs, thus providing new opportunities to capture greater market share through partnerships, joint ventures, and cooperatives. Next slide, please. Our third insight addresses workforce development, specifically that new and existing programs must be coordinated with business development efforts to ensure that training opportunities lead to hiring and retention, specifically for workers of color. The challenge is that unfortunately, the Obama era green jobs program was a failure from the longevity perspective and the mis excuse me, misuse of the term green jobs has created confusion and frustration in the workforce development sector because these are often green jobs to nowhere. As such, the city and state should evaluate, scale, and replicate viable pilot programs for building green jobs into green careers, leveraging new climate investments from the Biden-Harris administration, while developing training programs and business capacity in relevant fields beyond construction and manufacturing to, again, broaden opportunities for workers of color. Next slide, please. For our fourth insight, we looked at innovation and the need for a new paradigm to advance inclusive business growth in clean technology that focuses on black owned and other minority and women owned ventures. The challenge is that MWBEs are contracted to fulfill a diversity requirement without meaningful opportunities. And in such cases, they're without these opportunities for their contribution growth and financial stabilities, they are not perceived as meaningful business partners or as a source of innovation. So to shift industry perceptions of MWBEs and highlight their value in experience and results, not just certifications based on gender and or racial identities, we must lead with racial equity and environmental justice principles, drive investment in the leadership and innovation of those firms and cultivate opportunities for MWBEs to showcase their work to a greater audience. Next slide, please. And finally, we should address property owners' motivations and reluctance to invest in long-term energy upgrades, with, upgrade, excuse me, which hinders equitable business development. If building owners are reluctant to make these proactive upgrades, there will be a scramble at the last minute for services that don't exist. Thus, again, reinforcing existing inequities in the market, which will further be exacerbated by the medical and economic challenges of the COVID-19 global pandemic. But the opportunities are abundant here. First, zero overtime strategies could help property owners think of compliance in a more financially, financial, excuse me, financially feasible and achievable way. And reliable products and warranties could, uh, could build consumer confidence in new technologies that are just emerging, just like the rest of the market. And finally, the city government could leverage the scale of city-owned assets like the massive public housing portfolio to model expectations for retrofits and offer a springboard for MWBEs to establish themselves in this new market. So let's learn from our past and not waste this crisis by repeating outdated frameworks. We now know better, so let's do better. Thank you. And I'll pass it off to Kara to highlight some of our more prominent proposals of how to accomplish just that. Thanks, Polina. So while our insights team synthesized the uh, relevant research and precedents, the four remaining teams looked at uh, insights and developed proposals for um, uh, based on our research and interviews. And while we have quite a few proposals, we're going to go through just a couple of highlights. These proposals position policy, programming, and financial strategies for supporting minority and women-owned cooperatives through innovations in workforce development and retrofit technology research. The first highlight that I'm gonna talk about comes from our supporting MWBEs group, whose second proposal explored the unique certifications and skills that are required to do energy efficient building retrofits, as well as the particularities around warranties, restrictions, and standards required by so many of the manufacturers who are producing this technology. So these restrictions present a unique barrier to MWBE contractors who wanna enter the market, but we think the city could play a role in evening the playing field by one, increasing transparency around manufacturer requirements 
and two, supporting greater access to the necessary certifications. And if the city really invests in training for MWBEs and getting them certified, New York City will benefit in one of two ways or both of these two ways. First, fully certified MWBEs can actually take full advantage of the building energy efficient technology that's out there. And two, by having more certified contractors who are equipped to use this technology, we can actually meet the goals of Local Law 97 much faster. So next up is our employee ownership group who focused on a plan to create new cooperative business businesses that pair existing and emerging contractors who offer a variety of services. Eventually growing to become a super cooperative, this cluster of minority owned co-ops would have the resources to offer building energy retrofit services at the same scale as their much larger competitors. So while it could take at least two to three years to establish a full service or turnkey super cooperative like this one, if it's implemented soon with city support, we think this co-op could be off the ground long before key milestones of Local Law 97 are upon us. And in our proposal, in the proposal, the first phase would focus on creating a pipeline by identifying and training small MWBEs who have already expressed interest in employee ownership. And at the same time, the initiative would be starting up a small business accelerator. The second phase of this initiative would then pair the businesses who came through the accelerator with the businesses who came through the pipeline. And the third phase, finally, would launch a Black, Indigenous, and people of color owned retrofit business with support from investors who focus specifically on employee owned businesses. Our next group focused on refreshing the way that we think about workforce development. Their research showed a real lack of coordination between key factors that impact workforce development. The first being innovations and in technology development, the second being market analysis and job forecasting, and the third, of course, the actual development of workforce training curricula. So this research institute with a city investment would be collectively run by public, private, and nonprofit partners, both city and statewide. We envision that the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and SBS could start by coordinating these partners and then bring the partners together to expand the city's own research and development or R&D capacity when it comes to energy efficiency retrofit technology. We could then rely on this research institute not just as a way to ensure the equitable distribution of R&D knowledge among MWBEs, but also to offer workforce training uh, that's really responsive to the latest technology and the market's demands. In the final phase, this institute would then support a larger network of R&D cooperatives across the city. And the final highlight that I'm gonna share with you guys uh, is from our Catalyzing Innovation Group's first proposal, which responds to the disproportionate challenges and historic bias that minority owned and particularly black and brown owned firms have to face when they're trying to get investment for capital. It takes a lot of capital to enter the green retrofit market. And if we follow the historic pattern of letting wealthier, whiter firms enter the market first, we'll risk shutting MWBEs out of yet another emerging market. So we proposed a, a fund seeded by capital from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, NYCEDC. While similar top-down economic development models often lack an adequate focus on equity, this fund would use that initial seed money to leverage additional uh, development or additional investment from philanthropies and nonprofits. And then to make sure that communities really have a voice in the fund's investment decisions, it would be managed by a community development financial institution, a CDFI, or a minority depository institution, an MDI, whose priority would be to support minority owned firms who want to get into the green retrofit market. So these proposals only represent uh, a few of the proposals contained within our report, and they're ambitious, but transforming the retrofit market to help NYC meet its Local Law 97 goals is going to require innovative strategies. And doing that while evening the playing field for MWBEs will require the kind of collaboration between designers, planners, developers, 
and policymakers that we're calling for. So as Donna and Polina made plain, environmental action and racial justice are indisputably connected to one another. But because racism is still so normalized within our institutions, it's been too easy to forget that attempting to tackle environmental protection in absence of racial justice is inherently harmful to people of color who face the highest risks associated with environmental and economic health. That's why we invite you to play close attention to the careful connections that we've drawn between supporting MWBEs, minority and women-owned businesses, and innovations in reducing harmful emissions because they are and they should be inseparable. Thank you all. Thank you, Donna and Polina. And I'm going to pass the mic back to Catherine now. Thank you so, so much, Donna, Polina, and Kara. Um, we are really looking forward to digging into this further with you all. Um, but first, I'm going to invite our two respondents to join us on screen. Um, so Saul and Daphne, if you could turn your video on, and Polina, Kara, and Donna, we will see you again in just a few minutes. Great. So today we have uh, Saul Brown and Daphne Sanchez joining us. Saul Brown is project manager for the Retrofit New York Initiative, which is part of NYSERDA's multifamily residential program. Retrofit New York seeks to enable ambitious retrofit solutions for New York's multifamily buildings, really leading the way on bringing cost effective retrofits to scale. And Daphne Rose Sanchez is executive director of Kinetic Communities Consulting, which she founded in 2017, and a passionate advocate for energy equity. Kinetic Communities advocates and implements strategic energy equity market transformations for diverse New York communities, ensuring that frontline communities and people of color are a priority in a just clean energy transition. So we're so lucky to have you both here with us today. Um, and I'm gonna start with a few questions, then we'll bring our fellows back for an audience Q&A. So um, for all of you tuning in, please continue to submit your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. And Daphne, I'd love to start our conversation with you to get your perspective on why these conversations matter. Um, you know, I think when we talk about the energy transition too often, we're not talking explicitly about MWBEs. So why is it so important that we concentrate on the composition of who is doing the work? Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. It's nice to be here with you all. I absolutely love the presentation. I, and I sincerely want to thank the fellows for your work um, and elevating the importance of MWBEs. So to answer your question, I think MWEs are essential to any climate just transition because they are the ones that have been traditionally impacted by climate disasters, impacted by disinvestment for housing and for workforce development. Allowing MWBEs to be key in any action forward creates a restorative system where the government and utilities can acknowledge that they were wrong and they were racist and they're able to move forward and saying, we acknowledge that we did wrong. Here's a pathway where we can uplift BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color and other marginalized population to be leaders in this clean energy transition. And it's not just an add on, right? We're just not saying, well, you know, we have this large contract and we're going to give this MWEs. No, we want it to be centered um, around the communities that have been most impacted by, by climate disaster and disinvestment. Thanks, Daphne. Um, you know, part of what we found so galvanizing about doing this research is that it's not only important, it's also time sensitive and critical that this work happens right now. So you know, there's a real urgency to retrofitting our building stock now to meet New York's climate goals. So Saul, I'd love to turn to you and ask you to share some of the work that you've been leading with NYSERDA to really accelerate this transition at scale. Great, thank you, Catherine, and thank you all. This is a really exciting and dynamic presentation. Um, yeah, so Retrofit New York is part of NYSERDA's uh, multifamily uh, division. Um, NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. We're entrusted for uh, with uh, realizing the state's energy goals. Um, so for context, um, the Retrofit New York program was started about four years ago um, based on a successful um, model developed in the Netherlands called Energy Sprong, which is Dutch for Energy Leap. 
And um, they basically uh, developed a way for, uh, in a very short period of time, uh, retrofitting existing buildings uh, to net zero energy performance by encapsulating them in um, high performance uh, panelized systems, uh, reducing the loads on the buildings, uh, reducing the size of the mechanical systems needed to um, uh, serve them, and uh, then adding uh, photovoltaics in most cases to them to net out at zero energy performance over the entire building. Um, their initial focus in Europe was social housing or affordable housing. Um, ours is the same. Um, we're focused uh, primarily on affordable housing throughout all of New York State. Um, with, uh, we're funded through the uh, low to moderate income chapter of the Clean Energy Fund. So we think this is the best place to start, both in, from a business perspective in terms of aggregating um, uh, portfolios, but also from a resident perspective, uh, not only for improving uh, billion, building resiliency, as uh, Daphne alluded to, and um, you know, really sheltering our harder hit communities, uh, realizing the goals of the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, throughout New York State that um, very much emphasizes uh, benefiting disadvantaged communities. Um, and what we're seeing with the uh, types of retrofits that have been developed in the Netherlands and that we're just starting to pilot here in New York State are um, not only you know, significant savings in the energy performance, which uh, both building owners and residents can benefit from to help finance these retrofits uh, moving forward, uh, but also a lot of um, uh, side benefits or non-energy benefits in terms of uh, improved indoor air quality, uh, improved uh, resiliency of the buildings, uh, preserving interior ambient temperatures, uh, improved aesthetics, and increased pride of place. So we think this can have a huge impact on um, the communities that where these retrofits are being rolled out. But that said, there's also a terrific economic development and opportunity and workforce development and opportunity, which is uh, where our conversation originally began with uh, Sam Jung and the um, opportunity that you described earlier. So on that front, we think that um, especially MWBEs who want to get into this space, there is a real major disruption uh, heading in the construction industry. We think, um, not, I'll push back a little against your insight number two, um, we think this is actually a big opportunity for smaller uh, businesses to get into this space. And we have a number of requests for qualifications coming out really within a matter of days at this point um, for smaller businesses to, to help develop business models to really get into this space to serve their communities, but also to be uh, thinking possibly beyond their immediate markets to expand to a statewide level and even to um, adjacent markets in nearby states. So um, that hopefully is helpful in addressing a number of the issues that we're uh, focused on today and also giving you some background on uh, what's one of the programs that's underway with MyCERTA. Yeah, I kind of just want to respond to this. You know, a lot of times when the clean energy market talks about like supporting disadvantaged communities, we talk about the benefits, right? And one of the things that I really appreciate of this um, report that the fellows have put together is not really beating around the bush, right? There are benefits and we can talk about historical benefits, right? We look at the housing market and how there was a benefit for home ownership. And it was a mass nationwide transformation of transportation and of housing. But who didn't benefit from that? It was specifically black and brown communities that did not benefit from that transition. They were explicitly excluded from owning homes and purchasing mortgages. So one of the things that we constantly talk to our partners and we work closely with MySERTA and Con Edison and National Grid who are the downstate utilities is, is pushing them beyond the what are the benefits, but yes, that's helpful. Benefits are great, but how are you actually utilizing and mobilizing local communities to have the power and the decision-making processes so that they are the ones doing that processes, so that they are the ones capturing that funding so that they can decide how and what um, the transition looks like, right? And I think we need to kind of think about, and again, the MWB report addresses it straight on, thinking about how do we move past you know, we need to scale the solution. Obviously there's a climate emergency and I have no doubt in my mind that we're gonna get renewables everywhere, but at what cost, right? Are we gonna do it on the backs of black and brown communities? Because if we are, I don't want that paradise. We've already seen historical disinvestment. I myself have seen it in my family for many generations. So I, I'm, 
I'm grateful to hear NYSERDA kind of pushing the dial and giving MWBEs the opportunity, but we need to see, you know, the same commitment to put in wind is the same commitment we need to see for MWBEs and, and workforce co-ops. Thank you, Daphne, and thank you, Saul. I know we're going to be doing a little bit of toggling between sort of state level and city level work here, but I just want to pick up on, um, you know, your thread there. Daphne, I know that you have done a number of really incredible projects that um, do base in, in community decision making and ownership, and so I wonder if you might want to share um, one of those projects with us. Sure. Um... So there's a couple of projects that we are piloting right now. One of them is where we're thinking about this technology, right? Electrification and the idea of electrification is to get everyone off of fossil fuels as quickly as possible to help the environment. And so we've working closely with NYSERDA and we're saying, okay, this is a great technology, but let's take a step back and digest what is this technology? It's HVAC, right? It's not, you know, something fancy or, or or something that's unknown. And, and a lot of our communities have seen the, the equipment in other countries. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and Costa Rican and my family in Costa Rica, when I talk to them about air source heat pumps, they're like, yeah, we have that, but it only throws cold air instead of hot air. So the pilot that we've created with NYSERDA is to basically mobilize existing MWBEs in the New York City market. And we're piloting it on, um, on in Staten Island first to give them the resources to learn about the technology, to connect them to the manufacturers and the suppliers and the distributors, to educate them as well through SBS on what is bookkeeping, right? How do you respond to a procurement proposal? How do you um, think about and strategize about onboarding someone and connecting them to the other workforce development funding that NYSERDA has? We're doing this as an administration and back of house support to other MWBEs so that they can be ready for the transition um, to, from fossil fuels to all electric. As we've heard, the mayor's office um, and the mayor had recently announced that they want to get rid of fossil fuels by 2030. We don't want a situation where MWBEs that are doing HVAC work and are doing plumbing work in 2030 feel freaked out because they don't know the product, they don't know the technology, and then they'll wind up closing. We've seen this scenario before when transportation, when with community-based transportation, where they were used to phone calls from the community. And then when the app came along, boom, 300 small businesses closed. These were Im immigrant-owned businesses, cooperatively owned businesses. And you can even Google it today. There are still businesses that are struggling, um, people that are financially um, burdened and even mentally um, overwhelmed and, and have killed themselves because of this. So we want to avoid the same, the, we want to avoid that the energy sector does the same mistake um, and making sure that we are putting all of our solutions front and center in minority women businesses so that they are prepared for that clean energy transition and they're not lost on the way. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I would love to, to try and sort of connect, Saul, some of the work that you're having, you're doing at the state level to Local on 97, which is obviously focused in the city. Um, you know, it would be great to hear a little bit more from you around how Local on 97 retrofits do connect to the state's wider retrofit agenda. Um, and I know you mentioned the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act too, you know, where that fits in and, and the commitment to a just transition in that legislation. Yeah, so this speaks um, to uh, the, the pace at which change is happening throughout New York State. And, uh, you know, again, very glad to see uh, initially focused in New York City in terms of, you know, the very aggressive legislation that was passed with Local Law 97. Uh, right around the same time that the CLCPA was also legislated. Um, I think the main um, thing to look at in terms of the economics of it all and the opportunities that this presents is the um, rather significant uh, potential for penalties for not meeting um, greenhouse gas reduction goals. And from a preliminary um, evaluation that we've done, um, it seems to me that we're looking uh, approximately at around $450 uh, per dwelling unit for uh, a relatively small building at the, you know, the low end of the spectrum of local law 97, um, let's say a 25,000 square foot building, 
which is 10% above its uh, cap requirements. Um, starting in uh, 2024, um, they'll be looking at a penalty on the order of around $400 per dwelling unit. Um, that then can jump in uh, 2030 to about uh, $1,100 per dwelling unit. So when you look at it in terms of uh, these potential penalties um, and the avoiding of them, that suddenly potential capital that can be introduced to uh, adopt these retrofits. So that in and of itself is a big, big game changer and um, hopefully will enable uh, committed firms, smaller businesses to enter this space uh, while, you know, the larger players are looking, you know, and seeing, you know, how it's all going to fall out. So we're, we're very hopeful in that respect and are encouraging that. Um, there are a number of other benefits, though, that are, uh, you know, to be expected as well. Obviously, the energy savings themselves, uh, you're looking at significant reductions in the um, utility costs on an operating basis that can be reintroduced as new capital. And um, community preservation partners, uh, New York City um, Energy Efficiency Corporation, um, these are two of uh, close finan financing partners that we've been working with who are looking to underwrite to those savings and create new capital that owners can then uh, monetize and introduce, which also has uh, economic potential for the adoption of these retrofits. So, Again, all of this is going to work when you're starting to um, look at these other sources that aren't currently there that this legislation is aggressively driving and creating. If you're adding those to the mix, then the um, increased cost for these solutions uh, starts becoming more and more competitive with business as usual. And that's where the um, innovators and uh, new players who want to get into this have a real foothold, especially if they're targeting um, specified use cases for different building typologies that are out there. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone who's interested in this space to Google retrofit and why uh, that will take you to our website. And there are a number of studies that speak exactly to this subject. What does our building uh, stock look like? What are the areas for cost compression that we have? How can we bring um, the cost for PV down? All of this is really meant to incentivize uh, new um, or developing businesses that want to get into this space and really capitalize on a potential that some of the larger players, um, again, may not have the nimbleness and uh, agility to adopt and become the uh, innovators in this space, which we think with um, the impacts of Local Law 97, with the impacts of the uh, Climate Act throughout New York State, are only going to accelerate um, the uptake of. Thanks, Sal. Um, I would love to welcome our fellows, Polina, Don, and Kara, as well as Sam, to join us again. Um, we have some wonderful questions coming in in the chat. Um, I wish we had, you know, far more time to, to talk through all of these. Um, welcome back, everyone. But I would love to ask a little bit around cooperatives, which um, you all mentioned in your presentation, fellows. We haven't we haven't had a chance to discuss in great depth. Um, there's a question from Evan Casper Futterman around the difficulties that have been seen so far in bootstrapping cooperatives in the city. Um, and so the question is around whether the idea is that cooperatives could cooperatively capture a substantial, a substantial market share um, through conversions of existing enterprises from cre creating cooperative subsidiaries from bootstrapping union co-ops from scratch or some combination of the above. Um, fellows would, would love to hear your perspectives on this and then anyone else who would like to jump in as well. Uh, yeah, I can, I can start off. Um, that's a great question. And I think it would be awesome to have a follow-up conversation about that um, with the group who worked specifically on this proposal, as well as with um, one of the groups that has um, come out of our, our part two fellowship, which is going to be um, focusing on cooperatives and supporting cooperatives. And I think we would love to talk to you about the challenges and pitfalls that you've seen in your experience. Um, but, uh, to kind of briefly answer the question, the proposal looks at um, 
I think both things that you're talking about. Um, so there is an aspect of it that would look at developing a pipeline of existing enterprises that do um, that are interested in a conversion to employee ownership. Um, so not all of the burden would be on just bootstrapping and starting from scratch um, and building co-ops fresh. Um, but the accelerator program portion of it would hopefully be able to start developing some new businesses that would be able to partner with existing businesses that already have a foothold in the market. Um, Donna and Polina, I don't know if you want to um, add anything or correct anything that I said. No, that was, that was great. Um, I actually was working on cooperatives um, in Newark uh, in the second half of 2019. And one of the um, one of kind of the the pain points and we actually we address this in, in other parts of our evaluation is this back office piece right the back office resources right um it's a challenge for mwbes it's also a challenge in the cooperative space um because that's really what well capitalized you know typically majority owned firms have is they they have that administrative piece set and so i think that that is something that you know i'd like to highlight again is how do we really uh through a cooperative model leverage resources around legal compliance, you know, regulatory financing, of course, you know, lending is a huge piece and capital. Um, how do we bring those pieces together in, in, in a more cooperative structure in order to support alternative business models, period, not just co-ops. Um, so I think that, that that is an opportunity there. And I'll just add briefly that, um, you know, the whole point is that we have to be innovative in how we um, address all these in inequities and that, um, COVID and our economic downturn really taught us a lot of lessons. And we know that also the traditional capitalist structure exacerbates climate change, which also exacerbates environmental injustice in our communities. And in the report, we go into how, particularly in the black community, when we were intentionally left out of opportunities for capital growth generation, we had to be innovative in how we supported each other. And we talk about that in the report at some depth. So it's, it's you know, it's also, um, you know, a work in progress. We're going to look deeper into this, but it has to be something new, maybe something that hasn't been done before. It's something that that happened or tried to happen before and wasn't as successful. And how can we uh, adapt that into our new time going forward? Everything has to has to change, and we have to look at things uh, from a different approach. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think the only thing that I would add there is that um, I think Evan, to your question, it's probably going to be a combination of many different strategies given the breadth and size of the, of the market that we're talking about. And I think um, we will have to be responsive to um, the needs of workforce segments and also of different technologies. So I think Daphne mentioned HVAC and within that we're exploring the potential for cooperative business forms in the air source heat pump realm. And you know, nationally there is um, a shortage of HVAC mechanics and there's gonna be about 115,000 uh, HVAC technicians that we'll need in order to meet our climate goals and to uh, meet the demand of building retrofits. We also know that 22% of HVAC technicians are going to retire by 20 to, to 2022. Um, and in New York City locally, we'll, we know that at least uh, we'll need at least three to four times the amount of HVAC mechanics that we do um, have now in order to meet the demands of um, local 97. So I think that's just an example by technology and by workforce segment. Um, that, that really gives us an idea of what strategy is most appropriate. And in that case, it seems like conversions are a viable strategy there. But um, I think as we begin to go deeper into this subject matter um, topic, um, all of the strategies are on the table um, in order to you know, really maximize potential there. Catherine, can I just jump here and say something about this too? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I think this is probably one of the most uh, exciting parts of your proposals, this uh, proposal uh, one and the cooperative business structure. Um, what we saw, what we see in the Netherlands uh, for those uh, teams adopting energy sprong uh, is that, um, you know, you have panel manufacturers, those who deals with envelope performance on the one hand, you have HVAC systems and those who deal with, um, you know, those types of uh, requirements and things like that. You have uh, on-site renewables uh, and, and their whole business structure. Um, all of that adds costs. All of that adds uh, different layers of soft costs, et cetera, et cetera. 
And what they did was they basically said, we have to integrate all of this into one whole building solution. And if we do that, not only do we cut costs significantly and become more competitive with uh, traditional uh, conventional renovations that don't really take uh, energy to consideration or just have to meet code as opposed to where we really need to get to to meet our climate goals um, and totally disrupt everything. We want to look at how to renovate a building so that you have improved uh, indoor air quality, you have improved uh, appearance on the building, um, you have uh, improved resiliency, you can service uh, all of the mechanical systems from the exterior, you minimize resident uh, disruption, um, all of it. And guess what? You also get to uh, net out at zero energy to meet your climate goals at the same time. But all of this requires, you know, really dynamic thinking of how these pieces fit together. And the way we're structuring things with the uh, request for qualifications that we have coming out uh, again shortly from Retrofit New York are there's the tier of component manufacturers that we're going to be qualifying to provide the whole building uh, envelope solutions, the integrated mechanical systems, uh, the on-site renewables. But then they're what we're calling solution provider teams who are going to take all of these components, aggregate them together, specialize in a particular use type for the building that they're doing, and put all this together. We see this as a huge opportunity for new entrants to the marketplace, if only because there's nothing else like that out there um, that can really uh, you know, transform how things are done at a much more competitive price point than um, is the case now. So the fact that you all are advocating this and see that this is uh, really a pathway in to bring all these pieces together uh, perfectly aligns with what we're trying to do and we heartily uh, endorse and encourage. Thanks everyone. We have another question um, in the Q&A box that gets at uh, this sort of line of thinking around where is the where is the opportunity in this market? And so Julie Stein poses the question of whether there is opportunity to be manufacturing locally here in New York, um, HVAC systems or other manufacturing pieces for local law 97 compliance, um, or going back to Daphne's point around um, HVAC technicians and equipment, does the technology already exist? And the main opportunity is really through the retrofit work itself. So I imagine a few of you might have input here. I can jump in here. Um, there are manufacturers that have distribution houses outside of New York City. <laughs> they're in Jersey, they're in Connecticut, they're not in New York City. Um, so I think there can be a unique opportunity for the state and the utilities to, instead of incentivizing the manufacturers, um, only for training facilities, but also incentivizing them to develop relationships with local supply houses and local distribution houses, that can really start um, a full circle of having more of the products available to the local plumber that goes to the supply house within his community. So I think that's one direct action that the utilities and the state can start thinking about and, and putting that pressure on the manufacturers. Um, to your other point of, you know, is manufacturing happening locally? I'll let Nice sort of answer that. But I, I believe the is, one of the biggest issues is that it's not happening locally. So there needs to be kind of a, a reanimation of the local manufacturing market. Many times the conversation of industrial and manufacture, manufacturing is not present um, while we're talking about um, renewable technologies. And I would just like to uplift that there is a local climate justice um, advocacy organization called Uprose that has been advocating, advocating aggressively for reestablishment of manufacturing space in South Brooklyn near Sunset Park. We are slowly starting to see some progression, but it's not as fast as um, other initiatives that the state has. Um, I guess I'll jump in here also, unless any of the other fellows want to speak to this first. Um, so with uh, NYSERDA, um, Retrofit New York is mainly focused on uh, subsidizing the demand side. We're um, uh, helping the incremental costs on these pilots for the affordable housing owners who are looking to introduce them. That's the main route for our subsidies. But we understand that this is uh, at least a two-pronged in all in all reality, a multi-pronged approach where you need to be uh, not only um, supporting the demand side for the uptake, 
You also need to be supporting the supply side to actually uh, introduce these uh, new solutions um, at cost-effective price points. So we're working closely with our uh, other um, teams uh, to help introduce this. Uh, our advanced building teams uh, have a number of uh, uh, proposals uh, that they have put out or, or are program opportunity notices that they put out for uh, funding innovative uh, panelized systems, innovative HVAC systems uh, along the lines of what we've discussed on introducing. Um, our uh, advanced efficiency team also has uh, just re-released their new um, innovation market strategy pond um, that uh, really takes a very uh, early approach to new technologies and supports those uh, with funding. Um, and then there's our tech to market group that has a very um, hands-on approach, uh, really incubating new technologies uh, from the very early stages of just uh, concept and developing those with business plans um, all the way through to uh, full-fledged incubation and market um, capitalization. So um, all of those are opportunities that uh, NYSERDA offers these new technologies and supports new entrants uh, into this marketplace. Thanks, Stephanie, that's all. Um, I know we are running up against the end of the hour, but there is one last uh, pair of questions that I would love to get in, um, which are asking about the, um, the intersection of, of sort of reclassify, rethinking how we classify MWBEs, the MWBE classification, and also uh, the value of community wealth building. And this comes from Peter Martin, who's asking about the limitations of the MWBE classification, and from Rebecca Lurie, who's asking about community wealth building. I think the question here is really how might we reframe our thinking to um, challenge profit extraction towards community wealth for BIPOC folks and to address communities who have been affected by the historically racist and classist policies. I mean, Catherine, how can we address this in like 30 seconds? I, this is my whole life. Um, I, don't, I, I almost don't even want to get into it because there's just so much, um, but I really appreciate, you know, first of all, you know, even the term minority, you know, it has, has you know, triggers uh, we were talking about people of color. And in New York City, we're actually a minority majority city, and this country is moving rapidly towards minority majority. So even like that term minority also I, in itself uh, needs some reclassification. But if we're talking, I think specifically the question was ask, asking about New York City adding LGBTQ as part of the MWBE classification. Um, and that's a very interesting point in conversation. Um, I could talk about this all day. I don't even know if I have an answer right now. I would say that I would love to talk about that further and especially about the wealth building, wealth generation in our communities, particularly our black communities. It's Black History Month. There's been a lot more conversation about this, particularly with the uprisings, again, of the regeneration of Black Lives Matter. There's been a lot of conversation about this and it should continue. And I don't necessarily have an answer, but yes, yes, we should talk about this. <laughs> if any of my other fellows wanna join in, please do. Yeah, I don't think I have time to say anything other than I love that these questions are coming up and they're really important for us to continue talking about and I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to speak about them um, with the people making the comments. Um, hopefully we can we can continue the conversation as part of the fellowship in our in our next semester. Agreed. I'll just say one quick thing because I see the comment from Barika. Um, which I'm all, what she says is that many of our community rooted BIPOC orgs, not companies don't qualify as MWBEs. And this is an emerging challenge specifically for NYCHA in their real estate portfolio and the way that they're prioritizing certain firms for those deals. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot to talk about from, from the housing side, from the cooperative side, from the MWB side. So definitely worth a, a, another conversation and not a rush at this point. I think just from, the deputy mayor's office, um, you know, it's worth noting that the MWBE program came out of, you know, uh, Nixon era politics and that the movement back then, the Black Panther led movement um, for black power didn't advocate for an MWBE program, right? They wanted uh, systemic transformation. And I think we need to honor that call to action and the renewed call to action from BLM as of recent days to really put forth something that's transformational to really incorporate all of the um, opportunities um, 
that we're talking about and make them actually accessible to um, MWPEs or whatever signifier that we want to use. Um, and then I think to the point around community wealth generation, if it wasn't apparent um, through the report itself, I think that's a central theme of all of the recommendations. Um, and I think it is rooted in this ethos of cooperative action towards cooperative good. And so um, I think moving forward, at least for our office, that will be a central principle guiding all of our interventions um, in addition to, to racial justice. Thank you so, so much, um, all of you, Donna, Polina, Kara, Daphne, Saul, Sam, for joining us here today. Uh, we're gonna have to have you back for a few more conversations, it sounds like. Um, this, is, this is not the end, there's a lot more to dive into, but um, we're so grateful for you for being here and to everyone in the audience for tuning in today. As I mentioned, you know, we are interested to share this work and these ideas far and wide. So we will share the link to the report in our follow-up email, but if you work around these issues and are interested to discuss further, definitely please be in touch. Um, for anyone interested in our further programming, we have an exciting discussion coming up on Thursday in our Power After the Pandemic series in partnership with ANHD, where we'll be hosting Maurice Jones and Brandy McHale to discuss how institutions can embrace racial, embrace racial equity to support community development. So I hope you'll join us and please check out our website at urbandesignforum.org for more details. Thank you so much again to everyone and have a wonderful day.